All right, folks, thank you so much for coming to our talk today, filling a registry-shaped hole in the WASM component ecosystem. I'm Oscar Spencer. I'm a principal engineer at F5 Nginx and co-author of the Grand Programming Language. And I am Danny Makove, co-founder at JAF Labs, or uh, just another framework, Labs. All right, so today we're going to talk about some of the promises of the component model, some of the pain points that are there, WARG, the WebAssembly registry, and then, very interesting, the diminishing line between libraries and services, and then a little demo. So first, some of those component model promises. So of course, uh, being a language author, one of the things I've been telling folks for ages about the component model is that we get to have guest-to-guest -guest interop. That means code that's been authored from my language or your language can interop with code written in any other language via the component model which this is one of the most exciting things about the component model, thinking through how we can change software, how we develop software, developers picking and choosing libraries from any language ecosystem to build their projects. Further than that, start thinking about teams in your organization. Imagine if every team in your organization could choose whatever tech stack they wanted to develop what they were responsible for, and then at the end, you just composed it all together into one application. Starting to think like this starts thinking about ways that this is pretty powerful for actually developing software. Of course, portability is a huge one. So one of the problems that we see all the time as developers is I've got code running on my machine, but when I send it to you and you run that same code, the same thing doesn't happen. And that's incredibly frustrating. But with WebAssembly, the same code that runs on my machine is the same code that runs on your machine. And going further than that, the same artifact that runs on my machine is the same one that runs on your machine. And going even a step further, the same artifact that I'm running and checking against in development is the same one that's running in production. Now, that might sound like, OK, that's cool. But if you think for a moment about software and how compilers work, compilers spit out different uh, instructions depending on what architecture your CPU is on your machine. So a lot of us have those fancy M1 MacBooks, and that's pretty sweet. But maybe in production, you're running on x86. It's not going to be the same code. Granted, I know there's a few folks here who say, well, you know, the engines are going to, you know, get different instructions, whatever. But you understand from we have sane execution semantics for these things to make sure they actually do run the same on different platforms. And of course, sandboxing. We need to make sure that we're all working consistently together across the ecosystem. So we do this via WASI. We know, hey, there are certain system interfaces that we need just about everywhere. We're talking clocks, file system, I.O., those sorts of things. And through WASI, we're able to make sure that's all available in a consistent manner. But even further, making sure that we only opt into those resources when it makes sense for the applications, and we're not just handing out access uh, willy-nilly. And conveniently, for different runtimes, depending on their needs, they can actually change the implementations uh, to suit whatever's necessary for that particular runtime, which is pretty neat. Through the power of virtualization, that's how we can say, hey, actually, all these WASI interfaces, let's run them in the browser. That's just yet another implementation. So the last thing is we say we can do all of this, and it's still going to be performant. And a lot of people are skeptical about this one uh, because, hey, uh, the component model, we're not you know, passing, or we're not allowing modules to access other modules' memories. And that's true. We do typically copy data back and forth. But through the power of resources and handles, we're able to let data reside in one module and give handles to that data in other modules and methods to interact on it, which actually keeps us from copying data back and forth to keep things pretty quick. So did I lie about that? Is this, is this true? Are there pain points with this, or is it, it happy? Uh, yeah, so Oscar definitely just highlighted a lot of what the uh, component model uh, promises. Uh, but if anybody here has tried using the component model today, there definitely are some pain points that you uh, hit. I mean, it is a new technology. We just had the P2 release in January. And I thought I'd just talk about a few of the most common pain points that I've heard people talk about. Uh, so the first one is documentation. Uh, there are certain workflows that people say just aren't even documented at all, and they're 
correct about that. Uh, I think that there are also things that are outdated. And uh, there's actually in the Bytecode Alliance a uh, documentation SIG uh, that is specifically uh, you know, focused on improving documentation, and it is like, two weeks old. So this is an understood problem that people want to work on. Uh, the other one is composition. There are well, who, who, who chairs that? Uh, and I'm the co-chair <laughs> of the, uh, the doc SIG. So uh, bring all your documentation books <laughs> today. Yeah. Um, and then also uh, composition. So specifying in one component that you want to use functionality that's exported from another component. Uh, there are a variety of ways that you can do that. I'm going to show one of the newest ones uh, today called WAC. But so far, people have also found this to be something that can be counterintuitive at times. Uh, another one is distribution. Uh, it is not super easy to find a place uh, with a you know, catalog of useful components that you can import into another component. Uh, and similarly, if you uh, create an interesting component, there's not an easy way to make that easy for other people to import into their components. Uh, and then reproducibility would be things like Semver uh, acting on Wasm so that, that way you're able to you know, produce the same thing every time. And what I'd like to point out is basically all four of these bullet points are things that we expect out of a registry. If you go to NPM or you go look at Crates.io, every library there is documented. Uh, it's very clear how you import the functions that those things export. Uh, you can do cargo install or npm install and go get all of the things, and it's going to create a lock file and happen in a reproducible way. So essentially, uh, what I'm indicating is that the component model ecosystem doesn't have a registry that serves these purposes right now, uh, and I think that's what is largely responsible for some of the most common DevX complaints that people have. Um, and so we are going to talk about WARG, which is a project that is also under the Bytecode Alliance. There is a registry SIG, which I also attend uh, regularly. And uh, yeah, WARG stands for the WebAssembly Registry. Given that, it's a little bit misleading because it's actually a protocol uh, that is designed for multiple people to implement so that you could have uh, uh, several registries existing together. Uh, and the two most interesting features that uh, the WARG protocol has is that it is cryptographically verifiable and federated. And these are both um, not simple things, but I'm going to you know, concisely say just a little bit about them. So anytime there's any kind of SEMVR event, like a package version bump in a registry, uh, if you want to download that or publish that, there is a record that contributes to a hash that represents the state of the entire registry. That hash is going to get updated every time that anybody publishes a new version of any package. And you're actually given information, or your CLI is given information from the server that you are able to use to show that this record was actually incorporated into the hash that represents the registry at that snapshot in time. So there's really big you know, supply chain security benefits here where you're actually able to be very certain that the thing that you're installing is actually the thing that the author published uh, and that it was that author who published it. Uh, so we're really happy that you know, uh, users are going to be able to feel certain. Yeah, and earlier today uh, we mentioned um, you know, statements from the White House, and one of the ones that was mentioned was exactly supply chain uh, security. So the fact that this has been baked into the protocol shows that you know, folks are actually thinking about these things. The other interesting uh, characteristic is the federation. As I said, there are multiple registries. Um, and so uh, you know, I think just given what people have seen in other language communities, you know, uh, a variety of things could happen to a package manager, which could be a huge piece of infrastructure that everybody uses anytime they like, do any project using that technology. Uh, so you know, if somebody has concerns, hey, maybe that business could go out of business, or you know, they could get acquired by somebody that I don't like, or you know, a variety of things could happen to them uh, that would make people basically upset about the fact that there was a centralized place uh, federation you know, should help to alleviate that. So every registry uh, can actually have packages that depend on packages in a different registry, uh, and each one of them handles their own cryptographic verifiability. Um, at this point in time, there are two WARG implementations. Uh, there's one that you can see on, uh, in the Bytecode Alliance, uh, and that is like the reference implementation, and then there's wa.dev. So I guess I'm going to talk a little bit about wa.dev. Uh, Jaff Labs today is releasing 
a public beta on wa.dev. So anybody can go to wa.dev now and interact with it, and they'll be interacting with a WARG registry. Um, I'm going to show it off just a <laughs> <laughs> So this is what wa.dev looks like. Uh, I'm going to show just a little bit of it right now, because I know Oscar has another point that he wants to make. But then afterwards, I'll come back and I'll do a demo where I show what the workflow would look like in order to interact with uh, wa.dev. So right now, there are actually two namespaces. When a user creates an account, they get a namespace, which is actually a registry. Uh, there are multiple registries. And any time that anybody creates an account, that is a new registry that is associated with that namespace. So my GitHub handle is this combination of letters. Uh, and these are all of the packages that I've published. And if we want, we can go look at these. And any time that a package gets published, uh, the wit types are analyzed inside of it. And we actually auto-generate the docs on that package's page. Uh, but then we also have an organization that I created, which is WASI, where I've published all of the WASI interfaces, um, which many components are going to use. So if we want, I can go look at, say, WASI HTTP. And there's going to be a lot of information here, because this does like a whole lot of stuff. <laughs> uh, but basically, this is an interface. Uh, and these are, we'll see down the line how I actually use the information in these docs when I'm authoring components uh, down the line. But here we have this. And this can even reference uh, you know, things that are defined in other WASI packages. And um, yeah, we can like, link over to like pullable. So this is like a different WASI package that this package depends on. So a very similar experience to docsrs here. Um, yeah, I'll give it back to Oscar for just a second, and then we can go demo the rest of it. <coughs> So there's this diminishing line between libraries and services. And I'll tell you what we're talking about when we say that. So when you think about a library, what is it? It's importable functionality, right? You're writing some software, and you think, oh, man, I really want some extra code that somebody else wrote, and you bring it in. So you're you know, thinking through, oh, that's your npm packages, your crate.io. That's what you're thinking through. Uh, you use Simver and things like that for dependency resolution. When we think about services, you don't import services. They're just kind of there. We deploy them, and we have some way of interacting with those services. Typically, they're going to be sandboxed. They're going to be multi-tenant. Maybe you have a bunch of different users who can interact with it. Um, maybe you're deploying you know, using Docker or something like that. What if we could take a service that's been deployed and just import it as a library? That's something that the component model enables. Maybe you have some uh, services that are talking to each other over HTTP, and there's no real reason for that other than maybe within your organization, it's just two different teams that work on those services. But if you could just compose those two services together into one, you could save a bunch of network traffic. Maybe it's only within you know, the same Kubernetes pod, but getting rid of uh, stuff like that helps with a ton of overhead. A way you can think about this as well, and bear with me. Everyone's favorite thing on their laptop is their node modules folder. Now, <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, and imagine for just a second, you could run Docker containers within your node modules. I'm sorry if that made you want to vomit <laughs> like in the auditorium right now. But when you think about the component model, that's sort of exactly what this is. Because I can say, hey, I have this component which is not dependent on some operating system or Linux that's running with it, that's been packaged with it. It's simply the functionality that I wanted, maybe a collection of WASI interfaces. So it ends up being quite a bit smaller. And being able to have artifacts like that uh, that I can just run is actually kind of neat. Uh, you never think about, oh, let me just import a Docker container. Or another thing, when you have services that are running, you don't care what language that service was implemented in. You're, you just care that it has a RESTful interface or something like that. And it's the same idea with components. You don't care what the source language was. You just care that you can actually compose them. So we're going to see a little bit more about that. Danny, let's get to the demo. Yeah, OK. So over here, let's go like this. And let's also go like that. So. 
I'm basically going to show off uh, several components and what it would be like to use these components that exist in the registry together. Um, so I guess we'll just start with one of them and then go through one by one. Uh, the very first one that I have is, uh, is actually what's called a WIT package. So if we come and we actually look at uh, any of the ones that I publish under WASI, these are all uh, just WIT packages. So they describe the shape of something that could exist. And you could have multiple different things that implement the interfaces that are defined in a WIT package. So in the, what the demo that we're using uh, today, I'm going to look at the shapes WIT package that I published that exists uh, outside of uh, WASI. And so here, what we have is basically several worlds. And we can use any of these worlds to describe the shape of a specific component. And I'll uh, actually demonstrate how I've basically already published all of these components to the registry uh, before the talk. But I'll do one test example so that you can see how you would actually go about authoring a component that implements a specific interface that was published elsewhere. So right, if we wanted to, let's just say that I wanted to create a new package. And uh, we could call it. Uh, we could call it my component, the default name for a package. So then over here, I can say cargo component new library target. And then the name of the uh, shape component was the namespace and the package name and the name of the world. So I'll say M-A-C-O-V-E-D-J shapes. And then we can pick any of these worlds that are here. Why don't we do local hash map? So if I do local hash map here, and then let's call it my component. So what it's doing is, one second, and Oh, it's the local hashy map. That's right. I, forgot. <laughs> I uh, inserted an I in here because there's a data structure in Rust natively called hash map, and I wanted them to have different names. Uh, so um, thank you, Oscar. Mm -hmm. So what that did is it actually created this component called my component over here that actually checked in the registry what the shape is that's defined in this package and generated something for me that lets me know what functions I need to implement in order to satisfy the requirements of that world. And then I can go and implement that any way that I want. And if I come over here then, and I, uh, so that was called my component, and I can do cargo component build. And then let's uh, copy that binary up somewhere where it's easier to access. And then I can do warg publish. And that was called my component. And this is my component. And we'll do it at version 0.0.1. And uh, give it just a second. I think this works a little bit uh, faster in the States. Uh, but now if we come back over here, and uh, I called that my component, right? So it actually is published here now, automatically generated docs for that component, and it's actually giving information about the implementation that was provided in this component. So we would say that this component is an implementation of uh, the world that is defined in this interface. So now over here, basically all of the components that we're using today were created and published using that process that I just showed. And now we're going to show how you can use WAC to compose all of these things together in a variety of ways. WAC is a new tool. Uh, stands for WebAssembly Composition, uh, created by Peter Hune, who's made a lot of really useful tools for WebAssembly Composition. Shout out to our boy, Peter. He's really done a lot to make composition really easy for us, and I'm really appreciative of all the work that he's done. So the very first uh, component that we're going like, to start composing things with is uh, actually one that Oscar authored. And Oscar, if you want to tell us a little bit about this component. Yeah. So actually, real quick, let's hop over to this WIT file. Um, so the interface that this is implementing is this HashiMap interface. So we want uh, a component that implements a hash map. Uh, and it needs a uh, constructor, it needs a get, and it needs keys. Um, so decided to do this in grain because knew it would be pretty easy. So in this case, um, there are some bind gen that happen. And then the constructor for this, uh, we just included the grain map module because it's already a perfectly good um, hash map implementation. Uh, we make a map, 
set some values. In this case, uh, this is a ode to our local Austin WebAssembly meetup. Folks, uh, go to your local meetups. They're awesome. Uh, but we make that. And then for get, uh, that one's pretty easy. That's just map.get. Uh, and for keys, that's also pretty convenient. It's map.keys. One thing I want to point out here for this component is that Grain does not yet support building components natively. Uh, this is made possible through all of the tooling that exists in the community. So this uh, happens via uh, WASM tools. Using WASM tools, you can embed a WIT into a core WASM, and you can make a component from it. And that's exactly what we do here, and that's how we get it to work. Cool. So then I also have this CLI component over here, and I wrote this one in Rust. And the thing that's cool about the component model is we have this like language interop, so it really doesn't matter that Oscar wrote the package that I'm depending on in Grain and that I'm going to import it from Rust. That's just part of what happens when you compose WebAssembly components with each other. Uh, and so what we're actually going to do is we're going to create this component in a bunch of different ways. So this imports the HashiMap interface. And what Oscar just showed off is one implementation of that interface. And what I'm going to do is basically import that interface into this Rust code, HashiMap. And I'm not saying which implementation of a hash map I want to use. I'm just saying I need one implementation. WAC is how we're going to specify which component in the registry we want to fulfill that implementation. And what we're going to do is we're going to fulfill it with like four different components, and it's going to be really cool. Uh, so we'll uh, first do it with the first one. So the uh, CLI WAC file that we have here is basically saying, so I already published Oscar's component as just the vanilla hash map, and it's under the names under my namespace. And if you know, it'll get tedious if we go back and look at the, every page for every package that we've already published up there. But there's one up there that's called you know hash map under my namespace, and then there's also one that's there already that is the CLI that is uh, you know basically what I showed right here, uh, that basically just logs out the values for every key in that hash map. Um, so what we're saying basically right here is import Oscar's implementation of a hash map and use that with the CLI. And so now we can just run WAC in code. And this one is CLI.WAC. And this one is CLI.WAC. And this spits out a new component that, and I'm in the wrong folder. So this is fetching all of the components that I just referenced from the registry and then spitting out a new component that feeds all of the things that we just specified are expected from one component and another component. Uh, so now we can go and we can do wasm time uh, on cli.wasm. And boom, we see the debug statements that exist in the CLI. And the data that it's getting is coming from the component that we published that Oscar wrote earlier. Yeah, and let's take a second to just underscore what just happened, OK? So we had a component that was authored in Grain that was then composed with a component that was authored in Rust. So those WASM promises that you've heard us talk about for ages, they're true and real. It went through a registry to pull those components down and then compose them. So I'm incredibly hyped about this, as you all can tell. Uh, thank you, Oscar. Uh, so let's do that with a bunch of other ones, too. So uh, here we can uh, you know, spend a little less time going through each of these. But basically, what if I want to make a web server, and I want that web server to be defined using Oscar's component? right? So the first thing that I do is I have this guy over here called hash map service. And it is importing things from uh, WASI that enable it to be a, uh, basically, it's satisfying uh, this um, in, or outgoing handler, right? And from WASI HTTP proxy. From WASI HTTP. And if we don't know what these like, data types are that we're using, like incoming request or response out param, we can actually go look at the documentation that was defined for WASI HTTP, and we can find all of those types here if we need uh, assistance, you know, understanding how any of these things are working, which is pretty cool. Um, but anyways, so this, what this is doing is this is also uh, importing any implementation of a hash map, and this time we're also going to import Oscar's implementation of a hash map, and then we're going to create a service out of it, basically. So I also already compiled this, published it to the registry. I have a WAC file for it. Here we're again importing Oscar's grain implementation of a hash map, and then we're instantiating our hash map service with it. And I actually have it running over here right now on uh, port 8080, and if we want, we can see, let me do this, uh, I can actually get 
uh, you know, a list of all of the keys that exist. And if I, instead of doing keys, I do get, then it'll tell me what value is associated with Oscar, which is pretty cool. So again, we have a Rust service that is composed with Oscar's grain thing, uh, grain component. But then what we can do is we could actually implement a different implementation of the hash map that instead of doing everything in memory actually reaches out to that service, right? So over here, I have client hash map, which is another component, and it's also importing interfaces from WASI, and it's actually going to go reach out and make requests to the service that I have running on my machine. So if we come back to the CLI, we can actually compose the CLI instead with this client HTTP, with this HTTP client that reaches out to a service, and we'll get the exact same values, only this time the hash map isn't Oscar's hash map, it's a hash map that talks to the service we made with Oscar's hash map. So uh, here we have this remote WAC, and again, we're importing the client hash map here, and then we are, uh, you know, creating the CLI with that. And so when we do that, we make a new WASM called remote, wa remote WASM, and down here, we can just do remote WASM, and we'll see that when we do this one, we see the exact same information printed, only this time it's hitting the service that we have running on port 8080. So without changing any code in our CLI at all, we just like basically have our WAC as configuration where we're saying, here's this application, it was once running with something that did everything in memory, and now instead it's running with something that's actually getting all of the information over HTTP without changing a single line of code, which I also think is pretty cool. And it's also fetching all of that from the registry. We're hype about this. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, then also, just to like, show that if we wanted to, we could actually nest a bunch of components. We have another one that Oscar actually authored in Grain. Uh, and Oscar, do you want to talk about this one a little bit? Uh, yeah, so essentially one of the things you'll notice uh, with this uh, implementation here is that the keys are not alphabetically ordered. Um, it's a hash map, that's not guaranteed. Uh, so uh, what if we had a service that ordered the keys for us? Uh, so this one is a web service written in grain, uh, and that's what it does, it, it sorts the keys, that's the relevant line there. Um, but what's neat about this is this uh, component is gonna be able to make an HTTP request to the running server, and essentially proxying to it, sorting the keys, and returning the result and that server is, again, <laughs> using another component. Uh, and so chaining all these things together is pretty neat. Let's see it. Yeah, so basically we also have uh, that server running on 8081, and it is getting information from the service on 8080, and it's sorting that information. And then we are going to compose our CLI with another guest that instead of reaching out to the service on 8080, reaches out to the service on 8081, which will reach out to 8080 and get the information that way. It'll all come full circle. So I have the WAC file for that one over here. Remote sort WAC. And again, so it's pulling in our third implementation of a hash map, which talks to the service that's running on 8080. And so if I run the WASM time CLI here with remote sort, we will see that it actually hit both of these services, the one running on 8081 and the one running on 8080, because the one running on 8081 talks to the one that's running on 8080. Uh, and because we're talking to the thing that sorts it, we actually see that whereas before we were getting like Danny, Oscar, Calvin, we're now consistently getting Calvin, Danny, Oscar, because the second service sorts the information in the first one. And so then finally, we might end up in a situation where we have a bunch of disparate services that all exist, and then we're like, wait a second, does that actually need to be a bunch of different HTTP services, and the whole point that Oscar was making earlier is maybe this line is kind of blurry between libraries and services, right? So what we could do is we could actually get rid of all these HTTP services that we have and do composition on composition on composition and just do everything in memory. So what we have here is another component, uh, our local sorter, that actually imp imports one implementation of HashMap and then exports a different implementation of HashMap that guarantees that it'll be sorted. So it's going to import Oscar's original grain HashMap and then spit out a new HashMap that is sorted, but this one won't use any HTTP at all. And we can uh, go and we can look at this uh, all local WAC. And so here we actually see several. So first we import Oscar's HashMap component, then we import the local sorter component, which takes the Oscars component as an import, and then we take the new hash map and we pass that to the CLI component uh, as its 
hash map implementation that it requires. And so we can see I can turn off, I can shut down these services now, and, since, and it won't break, whereas if I was running it with the remote sort, it would break if I tried to do it because those services wouldn't be running. But here we're going to do this with the all local WASM. And again, we're consistently sorted. And what we basically did is we just reduced a bunch of separate things that would be analogous to a Docker container being different services deployed in different ways, and then instead turned it into something that seems more like NPM, where we've done an install and we have like several uh, you know, libraries doing everything in memory locally. And I think that's all of the components in the demo, right? That's all that, uh, for components in the demo. But uh, the fact this is all enabled through the fact that we can compose components together and pull data, uh, like the actual components and their interfaces from the registry. It is. And I guess I'd just like, like to end on, you know, there are several different use cases that get people really jazzed about the component model. Like some people really like the idea of doing things local first, and some people really like the idea of running compute inside of a database, and some people are just like, yeah, just moving compute around instead of moving data around and all these things. And I think that the fact that you actually have a place where everybody can put things and then it's actually there's an understood workflow for consuming it inside of another WASM component makes it so that you can actually start to experiment with doing things that like maybe I was making HTTP requests before, but now that service, instead of sending me an HTTP response, sends me a handler and I actually can do everything local first and then we can, you know, tie interesting local first dev in browser development studios to the registry in a browser and yeah, there's just like a lot of room for iteration given that we have this sandboxing that we didn't have before in our libraries. So I'd like for people to like, you know, leave this talk thinking what are the ways that I can take advantage of the fact that my libraries and my services aren't so different from each other anymore. Absolutely. Cool. And uh, that's our talk. <laughs> uh, seems like we got some questions. Yeah, and I think we went over, but I guess it's probably okay if we do one or two because we're the yeah, last we, talk of the day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do a couple questions. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, this may be an incredibly silly question, so uh, pardon in advance. But like, what happens if you leave the happy path? So let's say in your hash map implementation, in language one, if you uh, want to get a hash for a key that doesn't exist, language one would return false, and now you implement it in language two and it would return null, for example. So your contract would still be fulfilled by both, but like the implementation details then would leak through. Is this a problem at all, or is this really stupid? I love this question. Um, so this is something that uh, was solved uh, with, uh, with the component model is what we call the canonical ABI. So essentially, uh, it's an application binary interface, uh, and it's contracts that are well-defined between every single language. So we say the way you pass this data across this boundary is specifically in this format. And so the bind gen for different languages to actually uh, get to this point, make sure that the, that language's uh, you know, uh, idioms and things are accounted for in that sense. But so the um, like hash map interface, for example, I think, uh, can you go to the, um, the wit for the, the global one? Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is perfect. So if you look at this wit here, uh, so get returns an option of string. Uh, so the whole point of this type is it might not be there, um, but I know for a fact that I don't have to deal with a null or a false. I know that with the component model, I'm going to get the option type of none, and that's going to be consistent across all the languages. So a lot of work went into making that happen. So shout out to everyone in the WASM community who contributed to that. But that's an excellent question. And yeah, uh, I don't know how much time we have to do that. Oh, let's do another one. Let's right here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. This is a great presentation, great demo. Um, I was looking at your registry uh, just now. That's also looks really nice, great UI. Um, it's got an extra couple of clicks on the authentication. So I went to have a look uh, for the repo so I can maybe fix it. <laughs> Uh, and it's, I can't find it. So that's, that piece is closed source, I assume. So at this point, so there's warg, the uh, 
you know, protocol that we were talking about, and there's two implementations of it. So at this point in time, the uh, reference implementation is open source, and right now the implementation that is used for wa.dev is not, um, which we may open source various parts of it. I think that's just something that we're going to determine as we see what people want. But if you're so, finding issues, we'd love to hear about it, and we can... Well, no, yeah. my question was actually, just off the back of that, um, do you have any actual specific plans around you know, avoiding a kind of Docker registry, Docker IO type situation, or a secure software supply chain, you know, um, mess. How do you, what are your plans for that, for that registry from a kind of openness and transparency perspective? And how much have you thought about it? Yeah, I mean, we've definitely thought about it, and it's a great question, thanks for asking. Um, I think that we still, I guess we just went live today, right? And so uh, there are things in there that, you know, should probably not, be open right now because you know it would be like a security vulnerability for them to be open, right? So I think that just we are going to see how people are using it and make that decision as we understand what our users' needs are. But uh, I think it's very likely that like quite a bit of uh, what we're doing ends up being open. So yeah, Thank you. I'll also throw out you know remember that the Warg uh, protocol is federated as well, uh, so folks uh, freely have the option to say hey, actually we don't want to use that, we want to use a different registry. Um, and you know, you're freely open to do so, and they can all talk to each other, so you're not going to lose anything by switching to other registers. One more? Cool. Um, so a lot of libraries and applications need embedded files, attached files, file systems. Do you have any plans for, uh, I don't know, what are the artifacts that are distributed by the registry right now? And do you have any plans for attached file systems? Uh, yeah, well, so I mean, one thing is you have WASI, right? So WASI has a uh, file system virtualization, right? So they're, depending on what your needs are, you might be able to just leverage WASI. Um, but then I guess there's also... No, no, I'm talking more about like a like static assets. that also serves static assets or machine learning where you need some models. Yeah, so I actually do think still, uh, I might be mistaken here. I don't know if you're familiar with WASI vert, uh, but I think that WASI vert actually has a way to mount uh, so that it is like a persistent file system, not something that's like just uh, available on the fly. Um, we don't have like an immediate plan for uh, you know getting that to work inside of like wa.dev, but uh, you know that's definitely no, no. Uh, the equivalent would be like uh, Docker images, right? Because they have multiple layers. There you can have your uh, uh, related files inside the image. Sure, but I think that also if this mount uh, that I'm referring to that in WASI vert actually feeds mounted files into WASI vert in a persistent way, similar to how Docker would. And similar to the Docker example, like if you have a Docker file and say you include files like within a particular layer, um, similar to that uh, in WebAssembly is through your language's tool chain, um, like usually like there's like a Rust macro for this, but like including files that just get embedded within the component itself. So you have a ton of different options there, but of course potentially there might be options for static files. I know generally people are pointed to towards like pre-opens where you specify like a local directory that is like what is used from WASI, but I'm talking about something else called bounce. And I'm not positive that it does what I'm saying, but I think that it might, so yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All right, folks, I believe that's all the time that we've got, and we really appreciate all you folks being here with us today, and thanks again. Thank you.